just to kick off about myself, so so I'm Logan. I um, live in Essendon. So I don't know how familiar people are with Manny Valley, but it's basically inner north uh, Melbourne. So I think like Flemington, Ascot Vale, Manny Ponds, um, Essendon, Strathmore, Avondale Heights, those sorts of areas. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I've got two young kids, like a primary school age. So that's kind of a lot of the motivation for the work or for the volunteering work that I do at Mini Valley Sustainability. Um, my day job is as a building designer. So I've got a lot of experience working on homes and making them more energy efficient and um, sustainable. So that's sort of, uh, I guess, how I, oh, and I've got a science background as well. So I've kind of come with those sort of skills, I suppose. Um, so this is our group at the Mini Valley Festival this year. Uh, which was so we've got you know got built quite a sort of number of people over the the last sort of five or so years now. Um, so just quickly, I think you sort of touched on a bit of this already. So yeah, we volunteer run nonprofit charity now. Um, vision is and and this has taken quite a number of years to get to, but but you know the ultimate goal that we want to see is a climate safe and pollution free Mooney Valley for all. So we do try to really focus on you know our area because that's you know we can have quite a, a decent amount of input and and sort of um uh you know advocacy in that in that area um our mission is so as a group we are trying to inspire our broader community to care for country and to act on climate and these are some of the so this is can you see the little blue mouse or no yep yep so that so the top one was a clean up australia day where we um, had like 60 people volunteering so that's good and then we do a little bit of advocacy to the council as well um so our so sort of uh, last year we kind of came up with a community plan that sort of started to be a bit more targeted in what we do and we started to realize that we the approach that we are taking and want to take is is one where we not only you know we're not just sort of advocate you know an advocacy group like we act through in our local environment where we clean up and you know plant trees and things like that uh, we hold talks and workshops and demonstrations where we get people together to come and learn about things and educate them uh, advocating to particularly to council but we do also you know we're sort of starting to step it up a little bit to our local MPs as well so like at the state level uh, and then we collaborate with other other groups like for, you know friends of groups and 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 now more so with the council itself um so that's been a good sort of step um so we've got so because the topic of climate and environment is so big we what we did was went through and tried to break that down a bit into you know what are the really key things that that you actually need to do to build a climate safe and pollution free uh mini valley and so those so, so then we've based our actions i guess on the on, on those five sort of areas which are active transport's a huge one because that's about like you know the fifth to a quarter of our kind of emissions renewable energy obviously so solar and batteries and that and the like resilient buildings which i'll touch on a bit more in a second uh, rethinking waste so so you know obviously recycling but but things like we've got repair cafes and um circular economy and food waste and, and that as well and then healthy environment with trees and waterways uh yep so that's that um so a bit so this is a, a little bit about our resilient buildings collective so um I mean, it's, you know, this is all relatively new stuff. So it's not like we've got had many years of doing this sort of stuff. So it's um, kind of developing. But basically in, in our planning of, of this uh, aspect of what we do, we sat down at first and just thought, well, okay, what are the actual issues that we're trying to, or that we're concerned about? So heat is is clearly one of the, the major ones being a really, um, you know, it can be quite deadly, obviously, um, as the, temperature rises obviously you start to need to use more energy so that becomes a cost thing as well and just livability like if you can't go out and you can't play sport and you can't go to the shops because it's too too hot that's that's not ideal is it like we don't want that um so we developed a goal for this particular collective where to ensure that our homes are cool and climate safe 
so I guess you could adapt homes to meaning, you know, other buildings as well, like workplaces and whatnot. Um, so again, you know, climate safe also does to some extent touch on things like flooding as well, because in Mooney Valley, we have the Maribyrnong River, which had an epic flood in October 2022, of which um, most of the homes that were flooded were in the on the other side of the river, but we had like 30 homes or something like completely inundated here as well. So that's the sort of stuff. And that's going to, you know, continue to, to happen more and more. Um, the target, it was actually a really tricky one. Like the targets, you know, something for like tree planting or those sorts of things are a bit easier, but the, like to think about a target for this area, we really brought it back to the urban heat. So at the moment, so the, the little graphic on the left there shows that uh, Mooney Valley, so um, the state government did a, a sort of um, study on urban heat in Melbourne and found that the surface temperature in, in these areas is up to 10 degrees hotter than it would be in a non-urban area. So, and that's obviously due to all the, the concrete and everything. So, um, so Mooney Valley was the fourth worst, uh, you know, the fourth sort of hottest uh, municipality so I guess the, you know, ideally it's like it wouldn't be that hot even now, but that's, you know, I guess we're trying to think about, well, okay, we don't really want that getting worse, right? So what can we do to to limit that? And some of the solutions in our homes are obviously things like insulation, cooling, you know, cool roofs, um, and then clearly trees is, is a big one as well. Um, so now, yeah, just talking through in a bit more detail on the Renewing Dwell project. So, so the aim, I guess, or the goal of that, of the project overall is, you know, it's already a community space, but we want to turn this into a cool, safe space, which um, is a name that is a bit synonymous with like a heat refuge or maybe a cooling centre. Like there's a few terms that, that are used for the same sort of thing. Uh, and obviously we want it running on clean, renewable energy as well. So just a bit about it. So this this is the building. I think that was in the nineteen. I think it was built in the nineteen thirties, and this picture is probably from the sixties or the seventies. Let's say. Uh, so it's technically a Church of Christ. Um, though it is, you know, it is actually a church, but it's it's not like you wouldn't turn up and think it's a church just because it tends to be more of a like it looks like a community hub where there's all sorts of, um, you know, got art groups and things like that happen there. Uh, we've got a, there's a little free pantry there that, that we set up about five years ago now. Um, there's co connections to vulnerable vulnerable groups. So um, there's there's groups from like housing estates not too far away that come there and meet and get food and um, connect. Um, it's basically become our headquarters. So it's you know we don't own it and we don't like like we try to pay some rent if we can. Um, but it just tends to be where a lot of our activities happen. Uh, and as I said, we've got the pantry, there's bees. We're trying to, I guess we're trying to turn it a bit into a sort of showcase place for, for all the little different aspects of kind of sustainable um, buildings and living that we can. Now the start, so the start of this, the uh, Renewing Dwell project was, uh, I think it was actually kind of um, instigated by council who, uh, went and procured a, a build, building vulnerability assessment report through the Yarra Energy Foundation. And it's like, I don't know, I'd say like 20 pages. And, and basically what they did was went through and, and looked at all the, what are the really um, key areas in which the building could be upgraded in terms of its, uh, or what, like what are the risks, I suppose, or the areas where there's sort of risk and what can what can be done about that? And I've just sort of highlighted a few. So it's the, you know it's things like um, shading, like there's a lot of brickwork that that hits that gets direct sun. Um, there was no insulation in the ceiling whatsoever in the main hall space. Um, the windows are absolute shockers. Like they literally can kind of there's sort of like double sash windows where you can almost put your hand through the, the sort of middle part of it. So there's, you know, it's not airtight in any way, shape or form. Um, draft ceiling is another one. Uh, and then there's, you know, getting into, I guess, sort of uh, things that you might not have thought of and things like backup power. So for instance, if the grid goes down and you're trying to keep people cool in there, 
well, what do you do then, right? So that was uh, a, identified as a risk um, with a couple of options. You know, do you have a generator? Are you near the community battery? That, so those were a couple of the options they identified. So that was really the, the basis for this for, for this whole work was was starting with a good uh, kind of um, solid report from from the Energy Foundation. And then so from there, what we did was went through and developed our own kind of master plan of well, okay, so we've got we we, we know these things. What are we what are we going to do about that, and how can we do it in a kind of staged way? So we identified the key um, state, you know, key sort of works that needed to be done. Started to put rough costs against some of them, and just um, get a sense. Like, so for instance, with the rooftop solar, I've had a number of communications with um, uh, EnviroShop about uh, quotes, or so we've had a few quotes for for getting solar on the roof. Um, talked to them quite a bit about getting a decent sized backup battery that would run. The, the cooling and a few other um, kind of power circuits in that space, you know, for many, many hours. Um, there's things like shading. So we've sort of already installed a shade sail. Um, we're currently working on what we've called cool scaping, which is the idea being to kind of get as much green out into what was kind of, you know, what's partly a brick paved sort of surrounds around the building. Just to try and keep that cool. Um, we've in uh, it was in I think it was January this year we uh, insulated that entire kind of the hall space there in the ceiling. Um, double glazing's a tricky one. I'll touch on that a little bit more soon because um, it tends to be that you know obviously like it's it's kind of in some ways the best solution, but it's also extremely expensive to do. And so just thinking about is that the best bang for buck given that we don't really have any funding for any of this at this point so it's a, it's a challenge um, to know where best to spend you know the little funds that we can get um so this as i said we've we've already we're sort of plugging away with this cool scaping stage so we've had a had a local uh landscape designer come in and provide us with some plans there's so just a little snippet of the plan there uh but the idea being that we're getting up some sort of trellises and planting locally indigenous species, um, trying to minimise, like there's kind of a car park in there that we're trying to squeeze in a bit so we can get more green space. Um, so we've been running a couple of working bees um, to to sort of shuffle things around and, and we'll be getting to planting over the next couple of months. Uh, oh, and as I said, the, the, we've already got we got a grant from the state government actually for for the shade cell, which is up there. Which so this is the western side of the building, so that obviously cops a heap of afternoon summer sun that we want to keep off the bricks and the windows. Uh, this was the as I said the insulation stage that we uh, did over over early twenty twenty four. So we uh, replaced. So it's a it's a sort of inside the main hall is a like a dropped, uh, it's like an office ceiling basically with a, a suspended ceiling, uh, which had some old old fluorescent lights in. So the first step was just to get get those out so that we could insulate uninterrupted across the top of the whole thing. And we also pulled out, there's, there were some random vent things. And so we sort of ripped some of that out. Uh, this is a picture up in the, up above the ceiling there where, where they've, um, installed R6 bats across that entire, I think it was 175 square metres or something. So um, that's, yeah, already making a big difference. Oh, and then we took the opportunity just to do a few other things like paint the ceiling and um, replace panels and, and that, that kind of stuff. Um, so I guess, so one of the next main stages ideally would be uh, or this is from the quote that we got for the solar. So to get, uh, what was it, 30, uh, 20 or 30 kilowatts, depending on what we can afford, onto the onto the building, um, which is a you know, relatively simple task, but it's also kind of expensive too. Uh, we want to electrify all the appliances. So at the moment there was this like beastly old gas heaters in the, in the main space that kind of feel like they're just spewing out pure carbon monoxide or something at the moment. So they're just 
you know, not great from a health perspective. Um, but yeah, f funding is is a tricky one. So we did put in a, a grant for to the state, uh, like the state budget process, um, which we weren't successful for. Um, the council grants tend to be only sort of ten thousand dollars. So we're um, yeah, just trying to. I guess at the moment that's that's our biggest challenge is finding the next bucket of money to do this stuff. So um, yeah, if anyone has any ideas, do let us know. Um, now, one of the the other. Oh, so I just was touching on the, with the windows, for instance, where the double glazing is is the most cost effective thing to do. Um, yes, it's great, but it also has, can. Well, at least in homes, you know, it has a really long payback period as well sometimes. So, so it might take 20 or 30 years to pay itself off. What we've actually been lucky enough to have is a, an a architect and who's doing a PhD at Melbourne Uni at the moment has, um, is, is uh, using this building as a bit of a kind of test for, uh, like the PhD is sort of in repair of, um, like how do you kind of repair buildings rather than sort of um, and and communities that kind of come together around that. But he's also um, been modelling the energy use of the building and looking at things like, for instance, if we um, double glaze, you know, how much energy will that reduce? If we perhaps look at other cheaper options where, for instance, you, you could do kind of like a retrofit um, sort of acrylic panes that, that almost... Um, just come like go over on the inside of the existing windows. Will that have an impact, you know, and, and what's the cost going to be? Like it'll be a much, much, much lower cost, but will it still have a, a decent impact? Um, so that's just something we're working on at the moment. Um, so hopefully the results of that won't be too far away. Uh, and this is where it sort of gets, I guess we're, you know, this isn't like a project we've finished that I can tell you all the answers about. <laughs> In fact, there's almost, there's probably actually more questions than that we have answers at this stage. But what what we've started to realise is, okay, well, so we've started on this journey, but hang on a sec, when we get to having you know, um, upgraded this building, there's just so many kind of things to think about in terms of how it would actually be used. So, for instance, uh, who can use it? Like, is it open to anybody at any time in like in an extreme heat wave? Is it just people, I don't know, with a like a healthcare card or something like that? Or is it just people from the local area or can somebody from the other side of town use it? You know, that's a whole whole sort of thing to think about. Um, capacity of the building, like it's like I said, it's about 170 square meters or so. Um, how many people could you have in there sleeping at nighttime if it was you know, if the, if the temperature overnight was extreme, uh, how would you let people in and out? Is there, you know, does somebody have to be there the whole time to let them in and out? Um, there's currently, there's a, there's what, there's toilets, obviously, for a public build or, you know, sort of community building, but there's only really one shower. Um, is that something that people would be expecting to, to, to have access to? Um, food you know um is that provided uh, and then you've got things like pets and medication um and then i guess getting more into the health side of things okay so it's extremely hot we know that um health issues rise in extreme heat is there a nurse there is there some sort of process to call an ambulance if something goes wrong um so yeah, it's just just sort of I guess the actual use of space like that in an extreme heat event would be um, yeah a lot of considerations basically. So I guess that's that's um, that's the that project and that's where that's at. Uh, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the things that have kind of come out of uh, out of that and what. Um, we had an interesting so so I guess given that we're we're working on this and we're you know talking about it and it's um, become something that's a bit more in the public consciousness I suppose or for, for part of us part of our community at least um, we had an interesting situation on Labor Day back in March where uh, so 
so it was declared it was a severe heat wave so i think you know you have a heat wave and then you go severe one then you have extreme so this was severe um the health department issued a heat health warning and that's that gets triggered when the the mean temperature so that's the average of the day daily maximum and minimum exceeds 30 so say it's going to be um you know the temp, the top's going to be 40 degrees the minimum is going to be 25 then the average or the the mean temperature is 32.5 right so that would trigger a heat health warning however excuse me it um there's actual the data suggests actually that that probably should be a little bit lower like around about 28 because apparent apparently the presentations for illness and chest pain start to increase much more rapidly at, a, at around that 28 mean uh, temperature. Um, um, so what, yeah, so basically our libraries in Many Valley, which tend to be where people might think of to go, if you, you know, if you don't have cooling at home or, or whatnot, you might go to a library. However, that, given it was a public holiday, they're all closed. But pretty much every other municipality around us, so this was... Um, so we've got Hobson's Bay, Brimbank, uh, Darabin, Yarra, and Maribyrnong all had their libraries open. <laughs> and all these are little their little social media tiles saying, hey, we've got we've opened up for this weekend. Um, come in and get a drink or whatever. <laughs> um, so so we had a whole bit of a hoo-ha online about how just sort of shocked we were that that many Valley's libraries were closed <laughs> on that day. Which which turned into actually quite a good thing because what it did was then um, so I'm just going to flip to the next one. Um, what we what ended up happening as a result of that was one of our councillors raised a notice of motion at the one of the council meetings to look at heatwave planning and ask for a bit more clarity on what what the triggers were uh, for opening a library, for example. You know, how, like what what sort of times would it be open and whatnot. Um, as a result of that, the, off, the council officers came back with um, noting that the so the trigger for for Many Valley itself to open a library is for an extreme heat wave, not a severe heat wave. Uh, they did acknowledge that there were quite a few gaps in their response and communications around this, um, so that was good. <laughs> Excuse me, and then. Um, Oh, so this uh, this was really interesting, actually. So as it turns out, this is councils um, uh, in their sort of risk planning across, you know, all types of issues that they might have. So as it turns out, extreme temperatures are, are, are the one risk that um, after kind of some mitigation action still poses an extreme threat, whereas other things like... Um, I don't know what's this like a fire or a transport accident, like an airplane crash or or even a pandemic. Turns out after some mitigation, they're they're not quite as bad. So extreme heat is a big deal, uh, which which councils and state governments do need to take seriously. Um, now the exciting thing in some respects actually was that that again, so the councillor that raised that notice of motion through our council then took to so MAV is the uh, Municipal Association of Victoria. So it's basically like the councils all kind of come together and sort of talk about stuff that might be applicable to like at the state level and they sort of put motions forward to calling on the state government to do certain things. Uh, so the count this councillor put forward a motion, which I'll just read out. Uh, so, so it says that the MAV calls on the Victorian government to provide role clarification and resources with respect to the operation of municipal cooling centres and heat refuges in extreme heat or declared heat waves for the vulnerable community members. So, so the idea behind that is just to... So at the moment, there's no sort of funding that flows from the state government to local councils to operate things like cooling centres, as far as I understand. So... Um, you know, I guess it's a bit of a developing area. So, so to try and understand is that something that's possible? Is is that like a council's the best place to run these things, or should should it be 
you know, should the community just sort of work it out themselves or should the state government run it? Who knows? Like, so these are the questions that we're trying to push to have answered, I suppose. Um, and so so that's that went to, uh, I think that was in May. So I hope, I'm not quite sure actually what the outcome of that was, but um, that's something I'll be keeping an eye out on. And, um, yeah, that's uh, that's it. Amazing. Thank you so much, um, Logan, for sharing so much about that that project. Um, and yeah, what what really um, stood out for me was that great list of questions about who mm. this and what they are and what they aren't. And there's a lot of questions that really haven't been considered. Um, and as well, the the need for funding. It's a really good project that. Um, highlights the need for funding um, and is a good showcase for the um, a fund that Act on Climate is asking um, for from the Victorian government. So we're trying to, yeah, get that funding to go into community-led adaptation um, mm -hmm. to groups like Community Value Sustainability that are doing this work um, and really need the funds to complete projects 